Library of Ruina is a game by an independent Korean studio, Project Moon. At the time of this video's release, it is only available on PC, but it did show up on an Xbox showcase stream for 2 seconds with the wrong name, so it's safe to say it will release on that platform as well. It's technically in early access as of the day of this video's release, but it is a complete story. The upcoming changes are quality of life fixes and debugging. For example, one of complaints I had when playing this game is that some select boss fights cannot be replayed. That has been abandoned as I was writing the script. So keep that in mind as we go in. A direct sequel to the previous title by the studio, Lobotomy Corporation, it doesn't bother to hide how the previous game ended. I did not know that coming in, as I got library as a gift for my birthday, but it doesn't bother me much. Lobotomy Corporation is a game of experimentation and management with your SCP-inspired bodies, whereas Library of Ruina is a deck-building RPG. There are still unknowns and mysteries going backwards, just not the final ones. However, if you are the kind of person that has issues experiencing stories out of order, consider yourself warned. Library of Ruina is a story of a guy named Trolland who, on his way to obliterate the settings equivalent of McDonald's, finds himself in a creepy library books upon books piling up as far as the eye can see. The owner of the place, Angela, is not too happy to have an intruder on her premises, so she asks him some polite questions and cuts off all his limbs for good measure. But then she figures, ah, what the hell, she does need some help and she did intend to start inviting people in. So Roland gets his limbs back and a brand new job as a patron librarian on the floor of General Works. Man, if only finding a job in real life was that easy. So, you send out an invitation to the first group, called the Rats. A rightful trio of plucky thieves on mean streets who do all they can to survive, including even stuff like organ harvesting, as any dystopian hero should do in reference to Neuromancer. A good addition to the staff of the library. So you send out the invitation and meet them in combat to see if... Oh... Yeah, you're not exactly playing a heroic role here. Angela invites people to fight for their lives. They get a chance to grab a book that contains information that is important to them if they win, but if they lose they will get turned into books themselves. And then you use these books to invite people who are interested in what the previous suckers knew and so on. Six steps of separation from the lowliest of bums to the most influential figures of the world. But don't worry about it, they all deserve to be booked. Most of them did terrible things, at least 50% of them are irredeemable scum. So in conclusion, one in four people you invite there absolutely had to have their shit kicked in, so you're really doing a public service, like an actual library, right? <laughs> oh my god, I'm so sorry. As for the gameplay, it's a card game. You get everyone in your team a set of 9 cards as their moveset and equipment is done through these things called key pages. Pop one in and it changes your damage resistances and passives. Quite similar to Monster Hunter's gear system, but much more simplified. So there isn't any grinding per se, not for experience at least. Each time you turn someone into a book, you can be a little shit and burn it, which drops the cards and key pages of those people. It's a bit like a gacha system where... wait... gacha? Books. Oh my god, can I never escape? But no, unlike gacha games, there are limits. There's no real life money involved outside of buying the game itself, and each book type has a limit of what it can drop. So you likely won't need to redo the fight more than 4 or 5 times to exhaust the possible drops if you're really unlucky with the key page. Additionally, you can't get infinite key pages, just the amount listed, so you can't grind one fight over and over to give everyone the same equipment. You gotta play varied and you gotta play smart. As for the fights themselves, they aren't complicated, but I feel like text tutorials do a bad job of explaining stuff, so let me do it. First, you have to prepare. 
You choose which floor, aka which team to use. More and more unlock as you progress through the game and each has their own unique gimmick. Sometimes you can use more than one, so even if a party gets completely wiped, you can continue the fight from where you left off with a different squad. Here's the information on how many floors you can use, and here's how many fights in a row you have to do. The fights are fluffed as a stage play, with different fights being acts and combat being scenes and... Hey, wait a minute... Please welcome the actor Artemy Burach. Let us examine it. Oh my god, can I never Here escape? It's present. Emotions. Anyway, the fights go like this. First, everyone rolls speed dice, basically the initiative. You can assign one card to each die as actions for that character to take, and you choose the speed die of the enemy to attack. During setup, you can see what each enemy will play and who they want to attack. So you can set up defenses or make a character with more speed jump in to intercept the attack. If it seems unfair as hell to your advantage, it is, but that won't save you in the long run. Each card has a cost in light, which are basically action points. You regenerate one per turn by default, more if you defeat someone or stagger them, so you can't exactly attack all the time without running out. If your attack connects with a speed day that doesn't have a card, for example because the enemy is staggered or because they already used up their moves, it's a one-sided attack and you just wail on them. If two cards meet each other, they clash. At any moment, you can check the one-sided attack and clashes with the use of three buttons up in the right-hand corner, which is a good moment to talk about dice. Unlike in something like Magic the Gathering, each card has dice rolls assigned to it and there are three types of them. Attack, Defense and Evade. If an attack clashes with an attack, whoever rolls higher wins and deals full damage, negating the opponent's attack. On a tie, blades clash and nobody does anything. There are three types of damage, but they only matter for resistances and some passive abilities, so not much to talk about here. However, it's important to note that aside from regular health bar, each character also has a yellow stagger bar. If it gets depleted, they lose all cards they were planning to use that turn, the next turn, and, as a treat, all their defenses drop so they get double damage from all attacks. So, you know, not a good place to be. So what's the point of defense and evade the dice, if an attack can already negate an attack with a better roll? Simple. Defense dice lower incoming damage by the amount rolled, even if they lose the clash. So if the attack rolls 4, but your defense rolls 2, you only lose hit points. If you win, you not only negate the damage completely, but also deal stagger damage equal to the roll difference. So if they attack with a 1 and you roll 2 on defense, they lose 1 stagger. It's not an attack type either, so that damage is not lowered by the resistances at all. On a tie, again, nothing happens to either side. Evade dice are a bit more straightforward. As expected, if you win the roll, you evade the attack completely and regenerate stagger equal to the amount rolled to boot. The magic lies in the fact that the die is retained. In other words, you can keep dodging the attack as long as you keep winning the roll. On a loss, you eat the full attack. On a tie, you dodge the attack but the die is lost and you can't dodge further attacks. If two defensive dice clash, for example evade versus defense or vice versa, a similar principle applies. Defense wins, it deals stagger damage, equal to the full value rolled. Evade wins, the user regains stagger. Bear in mind, the evade dice is lost no matter what if it clashes with another blue die. There are more quirks to it, like ranged attacks or yellow counter dice, but they get introduced later in the game, much later. So if you have a hang on these basics, they will just expand on them a bit, not turn them upside down. There's never a new damage type introduced that makes all the old ones completely useless or whatever, which is refreshing for games with character progression. If anything, I was surprised for how long certain relatively lower level cards can stay useful if you synergize them well. You get a judgment cut halfway through the game and landing it is never not amazing. Staying on the technical aspects for a bit, I like how this game both looks and sounds. It uses the highly esteemed Darkest Dungeon school of one frame animation with enough effects and sound feedback to feel impactful. It makes some attacks with more wind up fall flat, but it works very well for the most part. 
The music has a lot of bangers too. A common leitmotif is shared by many of them, but it varies up depending on the stage of the battle, which floor you're on and so on. Some bosses get their own tracks too, sometimes with vocals by Millie, who also did the opening song. If there's one aspect I dislike in the presentation, it is the optional gear. It clips onto each other and commits the grand sin of giving negligible bonuses. So I don't really want to have this stupid drag on my nugget's head, but it gives the 2% chance of doing one more staggered damage, and I remember that one guy having exactly one when I was done with him, so I don't know! Oh yeah, and one thing that I think is badly telegraphed by the game, on the invitation screen you can just not pick one of the story fights and pick random books to send out a general invitation. A storyless fight with a bunch of jobbers. They drop really useful cards, especially late in the game on the star of the city level. I would totally miss this if I didn't look at the achievements list. I feel like this information is in the patch notes from months ago, but not anywhere else. Well, enough for gameplay. What is this, some channel about video games? Nah, fuck that, let's get into the story. Spoiler light, this ain't analysis. Not yet. It might seem the actions you are partaking in are monstrous, and they are. I mean, hell, your team is on the right side of the screen where enemies in normal RPGs are. But the capital C city in which the library is located is an absolute hellhole. A cyberpunk dystopia where life is cheap, issues like cannibalism and gang violence are ever present, and the corporations known as Wings are not just greedy, they are downright malicious. Technology has reached a point of downright breaking laws of nature, but instead of making human life easier, it made it even worse. Body modifications are so common as to be expected, like Unabomber War does. To get, you need to have, so good like crawling out of being a have-not. So, the library is not treated as the eldritch abomination it is at first, but merely a new kind of violence that shows up. But as you claim more and more lives, more people take notice, and you get such wonderful visitors as citizens of Love Town. I've heard it's lovely this time of year. This sounds like a recipe for an absolute edge fest, full of nihilistic droll, one that thinks it's deep to make fun of people daring to have ambitions. But it's really not. A lot of its aesthetics is edgy, but that's what makes it cool as hell. One of the playable characters is a chain-smoking redhead with a goddamn solace. How can I not love that? But there are several factors that make it stand out from the chaff, a memorable story worth committing to heart. First, the writers are actually smart people. It might sound like a baseless praise, but hey, remember how I said Lobotomy Corporation was about managing SCP-like monstrosities? Yeah, they're still around and serve as a leveling up mechanic. Defeat one, and that floor gets a new librarian and some power-ups specific only to that team. And at first, they just seem like a cool reuse of an old gimmick, but each floor strings into a different thematic hall in a beautiful way. Let's just say that you'll know what I mean when you hear the violins hit. And it really reaches into all layers of the game. The stage play fluff, the fact that this menu probably reminds you of the Evangelion opening. It is all there for a thematic reason. Second, the characters. Everyone, be it librarian or guest, gets screen time. Enough to paint their personal tragedy and what drove them inside the library, but never overstaying its welcome by turning into a Metal Gear Solid 4 ending cutscene. You get more insight after defeating them, as every key patch gives you a short text to read as well, plus the cards are often used to characterize them. Hell, take Roland. Look at this guy. Would you expect him to be anything beyond a self-insertable blank slate that other characters bounce off of, like rubber balls from a featureless wall? Because he's not that. He has history, trauma, ambitions. He needs help from other librarians almost as much as they need him throughout the story. And you have no idea how happy I was that he was not just a stock VN protagonist. But I'll keep my silence about the details, of course. Third, despite everything, Library of Ruina is a story about hope. Some of it beautiful, some of it twisted, but nonetheless driving people forward. To find freedom, to find love, to find the perfect recipe for a human fillet. But hope is the thing setting the entire plot in motion. And it explores what happens when two opposites hopes clash, what you become when you achieve your goal and hope for nothing else beyond it, how it can get twisted, how it drags you out of the darkest of places, the full spectrum. It doesn't preach, it doesn't talk down to its audience, it takes a theme in its totality and explores it. 
There were two Cyberpunk games released in the year 2020, and I only found out about the better one narratively and thematically speaking because a friend gifted it to me a year later. It's pretty fucked up when you think about it. Is this a perfect game? I mean, it has issues, but it made me sink 90 hours into it over the course of a month and I haven't even finished it yet because the final boss rush keeps kicking my ass. The tail end of the game is unrelentingly hard, but hey, I know people before me made it, so I have hope. The gameplay loop is enjoyable, it takes the best part of a card game, getting wrecked by a strategy only to use it against the same opponent, yeah, how do you like the mind with you yiffing furries, and keeps away the worst part of constant monetary investment and updating formats. The story always made me push forward, just one more reception, just one more cutscene. Library of Ruina is set to come out of Early Access somewhere around August this year. So, if anything I said even mildly interested you, please check it out. This is the hill I'm going to die on for the next decade along stuff like Disco Elysium and Pathologic. The age of fine arts nerds game studios is upon us, and this phenomenon is global. So please, don't miss this piece of interactive art that came from a small studio in South Korea. Maybe it will be a small piece of hope for you too. Man, this video was supposed to be out much earlier, but I really thought this game is much shorter. Also, hey, I recently showed up on a few episodes of We Hate Anime Podcast and I discussed a bit about Library of Ruina in one episode as well, links in the description. And now, our library would like to thank its illustrious patrons, especially the new one... I hate anime. God damn it, Mike, this sounds like I'm obligated to shill your podcast now. Also, shoutouts to Playhead Nora, who bought me bread and coffee just as I finished recording the audio, so I have to record this clip separately and it's probably gonna sound weird. <laughs> anyway, all patrons are visible on the screen. If you can spare a coin to give me an ego boost, please do. If you can't, please still share this video if you liked it. It's hard to make invitations reach people with my current power. Or just check the rest of the channel out and may you find your video in this place.